All right, and I'm gonna get rid of this slide here. Okay, so DNA and its use in genealogical research. Understanding DNA and how it can be used in your family history research. So a little terminology to begin with, because not everybody knows everything, nor do I. So what is DNA? DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is a long molecule that contains your unique genetic code. Like a recipe book, it holds the instructions for making all the proteins in our bodies. Your genome is made of a chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. The complete set of DNA makes up your genome, your complete encyclopedia of life. It makes your eyes blue or brown and your body tall or short. But why do we use DNA for genealogy? In today's modern world, through scientific breakthroughs, there are several companies that offer DNA testing. These tests are usually done by submitting a sample of your saliva, which contains your DNA, or by a mouth swab that collects DNA material from inside your cheek. The most popular DNA testing companies are Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage, Living DNA, and Family Tree DNA. These companies provide autosomal DNA tests and not all provide testing for Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA. But what is genetic genealogy? Genealogy, again, is simply the study of one's family tree or ancestry. Genetic genealogy uses DNA testing to determine the genetic relationship between individuals. I regularly use different DNA tests for my clients to assist in building correct family trees. I use centimorgans, the combined segments of DNA shared between two persons to determine a possible family relationship. So the usual number of chromosomes inside every cell of your body is 46 total chromosomes or 23 pairs. You inherit half of your chromosomes from your biological mother and the other half from your biological father. Scientists have numbered the chromosome pairs from 1 to 22, with the 23rd pair labeled as X or Y, depending on the structure. The first 22 pairs of chromosomes are called autosomes. The 23rd pair of chromosomes is known as the sex chromosomes because they decide if you will be born male or female. Females have two, chrom two X chromosomes, while males have one X and one Y. What is a centimorgan? So a centimorgan is really just a, um, a measurement. Um, it's just a fancy word that geneticists use to describe the length of a DNA segment, specifically the difference between chromosome positions. We inherit DNA on each chromosome from each parent, and we will share segments of genetic material described as DNA segments of varying sizes with our relatives. The distance between the location on the chromosome where the shared DNA segment starts to the point where it ends is measured in centimorgans. A DNA segment is a block, chunk, piece, or a string of DNA on a chromosome. It is typically determined by a start location and end location, and it includes the start and end locations. I use segments to determine if DNA matches are linked together by segments of DNA that they share. So as a good example, these are 23 chromosomes that show the sharing of DNA segments or portions of the chromosomes with my half, my maternal half sister. As you can see, there are quite a bit of them, 26.2% shared DNA. And in centimorgans, 1,952 centimorgans this is through 23 and me. They have what's called the chromosome browser. So you can compare your DNA segments from one person to another. They also allow you to copy and show up to seven different people all at the same time, which is a little confusing. But you can also see that since we are paternal half sister and brother because I'm male, and she's fam female, it doesn't always work out with every relationship. But in my case, it does. Because it's a paternal half-sister, we do not share on the X chromosome at all, showing that we are paternally related. On another match between myself and a first cousin once removed, 
it shows that we only share 7.34% DNA, 546 centimorgans. As you can see, there are a lot less segments in the areas on the chromosomes, but we do share quite a bit that shows me how we might be related. And as because we are a mater maternal cousin match, you can see that there is a little bit of shared DNA on the X chromosome. Well, the two major testing companies I tested with are Ancestry and 23andMe. Ancestry was founded in 1983 and they have about, probably about 15 million DNA tested um, and 100 million trees, probably more like 150 million trees now with 20 billion records. Uh, they do provide ethnicity results. It gives you the ability to create a family tree, uh, the ability to search through records, which is very important in your genealogy. And it allows you to contact other DNA matches that you have on the site that also took the test. The DNA test is usually about $100 plus shipping, but they do have sales. So look for them if you're interested. And it's best to get a subscription to help you find records and build your family tree um, is usually $24.99 a month. They do have a six month um, uh, grouping available uh, that's a little cheaper. And they do have a free account that you can use uh, with limited usage. 23andMe was founded in 2006 with about 5 million users. Uh, they do also provide ethnicity results and they do now build a tree from you for you based on your DNA results. Uh, they have health information if you're interested in that and you have the ability to participate in health research. They ask you a bunch of questions about your you know, your life and they, they just put it in a database. Uh, they give you the ability to contact DNA matches in a messaging system, very similar to Ancestry. And their DNA test is $99 plus shipping as well. They have less sales. Um, there is no subscription needed, but you do need to test with them in order to use their tools. Well, Autosomal, mtDNA, and Y-DNA testing. So there are three major tests that people can take. Autosomal DNA tests trace a person's autosomal chromosomes. The first 22 of the 23 chromosomes are called autosomes, which contain the segments of DNA the person shares with everyone to whom they're related, maternally and paternally, both directly and indirectly. Mitochondrial DNA tests trace people's matrinial line, the mother's line of ancestry, through their mitochondria, which are passed from mothers to their children. Since everyone has mitochondria, both males and females can take Y-DNA tests. Mitochondrial DNA testing with family tree DNA is 159, but they do have sales occasionally as well. Because Y chromosomes are passed from father to son, virtually unchanged, males can trace their patrinial lines, the male line ancestry, by, taking a, their, by testing their Y chromosome. Since women do, do not have Y chromosomes, they cannot take Y DNA tests, though their brother, father, paternal uncle, or paternal grandfather could. So there are some benefits to mitochondrial DNA tests. Um, they offer several benefits to genealogy researchers. There is very little recombination or changing of the empty DNA as it passes down through the generations. This allows a researcher to use mtDNA results to trace a matrinial line from mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and so on. Adoptees may benefit from completing an mtDNA test, as the results can point them towards their biological mother's family. Mitochondrial DNA also provides clues to ethnic and geographical origins by virtue of its unchanging nature over hundreds of years. For example, mtDNA tests may reveal if a maternal line has Native American, European, or African roots. There are existing mtDNA haplogroups similar to Y-DNA haplogroups, which can tra help trace ancestral origins to a particular branch of the mitochondrial genetic tree. And I will go over haplogroups a little bit as well. So where can you get a Y-DNA test? Only a few companies have Y-DNA tests available. Family Tree DNA is a good starting place to testing. 
and offers the largest database of matches. They have three versions or three strengths of their test, a 37, a 111, and a big 700. As you can see, it can get quite pricey for the biggest one, but it's gonna give you the biggest results and they test the largest parts of the DNA against others. So if you have the money to spend and you wanna do a Y DNA test, I would recommend the larger one. You generally don't need to if you're not an adoptee or if you're interested in always go to the website and look for information about what they are going to tell you before you spend the money, obviously. So ancestry DNA matches. These are the people that you're gonna find on your DNA matches when you do your DNA testing. We'll help you understand the ancestry DNA match list to determine possible relationships. And your DNA matches will fall into a category of possible relationships. This is a chart I recommend everybody try to grab. You can find this online at, through Google by putting in the Shared Center Morgan Project version 4.0. This chart will let you understand how you might be related to somebody based on the amount of centum organs you share with that person. It'll give you the minimum and the maximum range of centum organs within that group and the average amount of centum organs that you will share with a person in that group. The only ones that are most definite are usually a parent-child match where they definitely know it's a parent-child. Uh, they don't know who the parent is or who the child is, but they know it can only be a parent-child match based on the large amount of centum organs you will share. But everybody should try to get this chart. But some of my DNA matches that I'm gonna go over with you today, as you can see, uh, this is through Ancestry.com and this is my match list, uh, the very top of my match list. Um, as you can see, I had my daughter tested, but what you're gonna find right away is it's not gonna tell you who the person is, uh, how they're related to you. It'll put them in groups. It'll put them in parent, child, close family, second cousins, and then into extended family. Uh, at the top of your list, of course, are gonna be the people who are most closely related to you. In this case, it is a parent-child match. Now they do not know on Ancestry if I am the child or the parent. They just know that based on 3,464 centum organs, that it could only be a parent-child match. I did know she is my daughter, so I clearly marked her as my daughter. Um, as you can see, I also have, as I marked, two half-siblings, two half-sisters. The first one is a paternal half-sister and the other one is a maternal half-sister. They obviously are not related to each other because they're from different sides of my family. At 1,915 centum organs with my paternal half-sister, Linda, um, you can see that it shows in the group of co close family and the possible relationship of close family to first cousin. When we first met up, we believed us to be first cousins until we found out that it was not really possible for that match. Um, I found out right away that Susan is my half-sister based on her DNA test and family trees that I was able to build. As you can see, I color-coded my two half-siblings and my maternal first cousin once removed below them into certain groups. I have a magenta dot listed for my paternal side. I have a yellow dot for my maternal side, which I broke down even further into grandparent sets besides being mom and dad, I broke it down to four different grandparents as well. So one of the things I wanted to go over is how to understand cousin relationships, because not everybody's gonna be your exact first cousin or second cousin or third cousin. Sometimes they are off by one generation, meaning they are one time removed or two time removed and so on. The easiest way to understand this is for every G in grandparent, the most common recent ancestor to you or the match person, the match that you have is going to be that number cousin. For instance, on the first one, her great grandparents are my grandparents. The most common recent ancestor are my grandparents, making her my first cousin. 
but she is one generation younger than I am. She is off by one generation because her great grandparents are my grandparents. She is my first cousin, one time removed. When we go down to the second one, her great grandparents, two G's, the most common recent ancestor, and are my great grand, great great grandparents, meaning she is my second cousin once removed and I am one generation younger than she is. The third one's a little special. He is a half first cousin once removed because his grandfather, one G, first cousin, is my great grandfather, off by one generation. But his grandmother is not related to me. Um, this way, he is only a half first cousin once removed. He is, his father was half brother with my grandfather. So that's why we are off by one generation and he is only a half first cousin. So when you get your match list, you're gonna be able to click on any one of your matches and you can go to a section called shared matches. These are the people who are gonna share DNA between you, your match and themselves. It does not show you how the other person is related to everybody, but you're gonna find that in 23andMe, but not on Ancestry. But as you can see, the people that are on the top of my list that share DNA between myself and my paternal half sister, Linda Wilson, one of course is gonna be my daughter. She is gonna match on both sides of my family because I am the most common recent ancestor to Amanda. The next one down is an extended family member, second to third cousin. And I do know they are on my father's side. Um, I just don't know exactly how they're related because of you have to put them in a tree. But I did mark down that she is on that side of the family with my little uh, magenta dot. These are some more of the matches between Linda and I. And as you can see, I wanted to break down and show you certain things. Uh, don't mind me if I break it up a little bit because uh, I actually did a lot of new slides tonight. So um, how I'm gonna word it and explain it is a little new right now. But as you can see, as you go down in relationship, um, the amount of centum organs gets smaller and smaller. Some of them I have a common ancestor to, like the person named Bob. Um, he, they are all going to be on my father's side because these are paternal matches to my half-sister, Linda, who is my paternal match. So they're all going to be on the same uh, side of the family. But I also broke them down a little further, like I told you. The first person, Bob, as you can see, has an orange dot opposed to a magenta one because he is on my paternal mother's line. The next one down, the Galay family, who I've been working on very diligently to find more relatives, um, as you can see, is my paternal father's line. Because my biological father was adopted, I have to do more research into his line than any others because they don't show up as easily. They're not so apparent as easy as, as the other side. Um, the paternal father's line um, is very distinct because they come mostly from Belgium, France, and Germany. And the name Galay is a very Belgium name. So as you can see, I broke them down and showed you how people are related uh, based on the dots and the color coding, which is very important to do on Ancestry so you can keep track of your family and their lines. So on the other hand, I have my sister, Susan, who is my maternal half sister. And again, my daughter is gonna be a match to her as well because I am the most common recent ancestor. And as you can see, I have another person who is a first cousin once removed. And I put her dot as yellow as well because she is on the mother's side. And from Susan, a couple of more of the matches to show you that I have them, I have them color coded so that they could show you which line of the family they come from, which makes it a little easier for you to understand. As you can see, my maternal mother's line is yellow and my maternal father's line 
is going to be green. So anytime I go to a shared match or get a new match and I can see who they share DNA with, I can figure out how they're related to me, which maternal uh, side, paternal side, or again, which maternal and paternal side from them. So I have them broken down into grandparent sets. When I get further into my research and I'm able to figure out how they're related to each other through great grandparents, I will add another set of dots. Twenty three and me is a little different on how you're going to see matches. But again, like ancestry, you will see either a picture, initials or a name or an alias if they choose to use it. Um, you will see the estimated relationship of that person that you are sharing DNA with. For instance, I had Linda, my sister, also do a 23andMe to see what the results would come out. And they're very similar in numbers to Ancestry. So I was very happy to see that. Um, as you can see that I have uh, several cousins that are related to me on this line. Um, these are all my matches. Uh, they are not all shared matches with Linda. But I did break down some of the family on 23andMe and how they might be related to Linda. 23andMe will show you not only how the match is related to me, but also how they're related to Linda, which is very important to find out how they are related. Now, obviously, since she's my half sister, all the numbers should be similar, but DNA is a little weird. Linda might not have gotten the same amount or exactly the same parts of DNA from one match to another. So some of them might be a little off. So for instance, the first one, Smith, shows her that we're second cousins to me, and she's also second cousins with Linda, which should make sense. But you can see the percentage of, of DNA that we share is a little less for Linda. Um, and the next one down is the same relationship, a second cousin match, but for Linda, she got more of his DNA than I got. So remember, it's always an estimate, but um, it's very good on 23andMe. Uh, they have very good genetic genealogy tools, but very poor research tools. So always keep that in mind. But as you can see, there's a pattern here, right? Uh, there are quite a few. I have three Smiths on this line, most likely from all the same family. And as you can see, some of them are similar in relationship. As you can see, there's also a Heinzel name, which also shows that there is a relationship between those people. Those surnames are very important. So on the side, I wrote down which side of the family they're on. So I can disconcern which ones are which. So the Smith family is going to be my father's father's line. And the Heinzel family is my paternal mother's line. So that'll also help you understand and put people in the correct position in a family tree. One of the places as uh, someone who's doing their genetic genealogy or DNA testing and understanding your DNA matches, uh, the best place for you to learn how to do certain things would be DNA Painter. DNA Painter is a website for genealogists and family history enthusiasts who have taken an autosomal DNA test. They have several tools. The first one is the DNA shared Centimorgan tool to figure out how you're related to a match. It'll give you a breakdown of how you might be related to that person based on the shared amount of DNA that you share with the person. They also have called what are the odds tool, which you will need to use as a family tree to help you identify an unknown parent or ancestor. They also have a way to visualize your tree in a fan chart and to understand DNA inheritance paths. You can build a tree or you can import one. You can track the DNA you share with matches and map segments to ancestors. It'll give you a chart to show you where certain segments might be related to certain lines of your ancestors. And the best part is DNA Painter is free for you to use. Just sign up with an account with a username and a password. So one of the tools I use regularly 
which is on that chart as well that I told you you should get, is called the Shared Santa Morgan, Santa Morgan Project. This example shows how I use the percentage of shared DNA of my half sister, and it calculates the percentage into Santa Morgans. It shows the only possible relationships those numbers could be. Knowing that my half sister is only 11 years older than me, I can discount the ones that were not possible. She cannot, be not, she cannot be my grandmother or grandchild or vice versa. Based on my other research, it was decided that she is not my aunt because she has another, any, no other known siblings, nor are my niece and nephew only leaving a half sibling since I don't have any known biological brothers that had a child, which would make her my niece and nephew. So the only one left is half sibling. So after you put your numbers in, you're going to get the chart, the shared Santa Morgan project 4.0 chart, and it'll highlight the areas to show you how you might be related to that person, the minimum, the maximum, and the average amount of Santa, Santa Morgans based on that relationship. One of the other tools at DNA Painter is called, what are the odds? A oh, good thing for this to use, to, the reason why you would want to use this tool is if you have an unknown parentage or an unknown ancestor that you're not sure about. What you would do is you would build a tree, either on Ancestry or MyHeritage or any other place where you could turn it into a GEDCOM file. And you take the GEDCOM file and you place it into DNA Painter, what are the odds tool? And you will be able to produce hypotheses about who a person might be the most common relative to the person you are looking for. This is one of my client's trees. And as you can see, it'll give you a score from one to uh, infinity. Uh, the higher the number of hypothesis, the chance of the score is the most likely candidate. For instance, as you can see, at hypothesis number 15, my score is 22,000. 710, opposed to all the other numbers, which are not quite as high as that. That would be my best guess on to who the most common recent ancestor would be to the person we are looking for. Just one of the tools for you to look at. I could have got more into that, but if it would have taken a, a bit more time, but it's a great tool. There are tutorials on how to use it. So I wanted to go back to haplogroups because haplogroups are sort of your mtDNA test and your yDNA test light, okay? 23andMe shows you your X chromosome haplogroups and your y and your yDNA uh, haplogroup. It'll help you understand how you might be related to somebody. So I have uh, I did a match between myself and one of my relatives named Stephen. Um, as you can see, it says my maternal haplogroup identifies unbroken lines of women that trace back to the same ancient common ancestor. Because your haplogroups do not match, you are most likely not related from direct line of female ancestors, meaning this is most likely going to be a paternal haplogroup match, meaning he's going to be on my paternal side. And next to it, you can see Paternal haplogroups identify unbroken lines that trace back to the same co a common ancient ancestor, and we have a match. The RL is close enough for me to know that we have a direct line from one common male ancestor, putting them on my paternal haplogroup. And just the opposite. I have uh, one I did with Shannon. And Shannon is another relative of mine, a first cousin once removed. And our most common recent ancestor is my grandmother. Showing, and then it shows that we share the same exact maternal haplogroup. So it is possible that I am related uh, through a direct line female ancestor, but it also might mean that I match because we share much older roots in the same part of the world. In this case, she is related to me through a direct line of female ancestors, not very far back at all, showing that we have the same exact maternal haplogroup. Obviously, because Shannon is female, she does not carry Y DNA, 
then we will not show as a paternal haplogroup. It will not show and will be able to give me a paternal haplogroup for her. She doesn't have a paternal haplogroup. But when you get your DNA data back from 23andMe or um, Ancestry or any of the other places, um, you can move your DNA data to other sites. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe results data can be transferred to other sites in order to find more possible matches of your family. Ancestry DNA and 23andMe do not allow you to upload that DNA data to their sites though. GEDmatch is an open public database that accepts DNA data from Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, FamilyTreeDNA, and LivingDNA. The results of the transfer will show a database of DNA matches across all of the DNA companies. Since GEDmatch is an open and public forum, the privacy of your data is not completely secure and can be viewed by anyone which, excuse me, wishing to check that database. You can decide the level of privacy you wish to achieve on GEDmatch. GEDmatch was used to find the family information that ultimately led to the arrest of the Golden State Killer who was sought after for almost 40 years. And there are other instances of people getting in trouble through Jed Match as well, or getting caught through their DNA. So this is a listing of my DNA matches over across all the databases of different sites that people used to upload their DNA to Jed Match. And as you can see, I highlighted that the letters of the kit numbers correspond to different testing sites. Ancestry is A, 23andMe is M, Family Tree is T, and MyHeritage DNA starts with the letter H. There are a few others that you're gonna find, but uh, they're very small and you won't get a lot of matches with other letters other than those four. So those are the most four important ones to uh, look for. As you can see, it'll show a name, which I covered up, or an alias or initials, depending on what they wanted to use. Um, it will show an email address. Um, it'll also show you the largest um, segment size, and it'll show you the total centimorgans that you share with the person. Then you can use DNA Painter, plug it in, and it'll give you an idea of how that person is related to you. But the only way to truly know how they're related to you is to put it in a family tree in the correct position. GEDmatch also has a chromosome browser like 23andMe does. As you can see, this shows Linda and I's, uh, my half sister, it only shows the first two chromosomes and the segments we share. I didn't need to go through every uh, listing of um, DNA segments um, all, the, all the chromosomes to show you what I was trying to get at here. But FNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, a big word, are tiny pieces of a chromosome that contain distinct blocks of information. There are thousands of them per chromosome. SNPs are compared between two people to see if they match. The amount of information in shared SNPs, again, are measured in centimorgans. So SMPs are those tiny little pieces of segments that you share. So based on the chart, you can see the valid validity of the segments. The blue sections at the bottom uh, show a very significant amount of DNA. And the little green lines show pairs with a full match and the yellow areas show a half match. We're gonna show more half match because we have siblings then we're gonna show full match, but you can see that we do have some full match segments uh, listed, but they're small, as you can see. So using DNA test results, uh, ethnicity results in your, in your DNA. So ethnicity results from DNA testing sites vary because of different test testing methods used. My two DNA tests, Ancestry and 23andMe, vary only a little but I have seen wide changes between clients' DNA testing sites. Ethnicity can show you where your ancestors came from and approximately when they might've left their homeland 
or migrated to other parts of the world. Tracing migration will assist you in finding family units that share similar migration. Tracking movements of families show a lifetime, lifeline of family history. So for instance, these are my um, ethnicity results from Ancestry. As you can see, I, sh I show that I am European Jewish, which is considered Ashkenazi Jewish, uh, 51%. It also shows that I have some family from England, Northwestern Europe, Germanic Europe, and a little bit from Eastern Europe and Russia. So most of my family came from those big areas of the green and the ochre and the yellow in that section. Um, and I, when I first learned about my um, family, I believed that I was 100% Ashkenazi Jewish and I would be 100% Jewish and it didn't turn out that way. I'm only half Jewish. Uh, based on that. I mean, I'm 100% religious Jewish and religion, but not based on ethnicity. And on 23andMe, you can see they have very similar numbers. Um, a little small for you to read, but it's 50.4% uh, Ashkenazi Jewish, 35.2% um, uh, Northwestern Europe. 23andMe get a little more detailed on where your family came from and where your ethnicity is from, because they actually can break it down that some of my family came from greater London and also from uh, very specific areas of uh, French and German, including Flanders and Belgium and North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. Ancestry is, uh, has a lot more geographic regions and they pinpoint uh, a lot better than they do on Ancestry. Uh, but they have they both have their pluses and minuses. Um, so usually I like telling people, uh, do both if you can. Uh, that way you get the best of both worlds. But they are very similar in results with Ancestry. One of the things that Ancestry has, which is very uh, smart for them to have and very helpful in understanding your genealogy and your ethnicity within it, is it shows you a timeline um, an actual map of time to show you uh, based on your family tree and information you have in there about your family, where they came from and when. So as you can see, I have two marks there. I have four people from the Austria area and three people from the Hungary Slovakia, Slovakia area. Now, if you consider that Austria, uh, Hung Hung Hungary were once one country, you have to remember that over time, uh, countries' names have changed or ownership of certain land has changed, obviously. Russia took over most of Poland, uh, Czech, the Slavs, um, a lot of Hungary and Romania. So a lot of those areas became under Russian control. So you always have to keep that under, um, keep that in and understand that as well. But as you can see, it breaks down the timeline 1825, 1850, 1875. So you can sort of trace when people left their homeland and came to the United States. As it shows, one of my first great grandmothers and one of my first great grandfathers did come around 1850 based on my results of my DNA test and knowing, um, putting them in the right position within my family tree. So you can see um, when they came over approximately. It also gives you a little story of Eastern European travel. Um, it'll tell you about your family. It gives you a little story, uh, which is always very interesting to read as well. So those are other things that Ancestry has, 23andMe does not have. And as you can see, more of my family, including my maternal grandfather coming over in the 1875 region and it gives you, again, another little story about people in your tree and when they traveled from other parts of the world and when they came here. So it gives you a little idea. This slide is very, very interesting because this is really family tree kind of thing. But your DNA gets mixed up with a lot of different people. So this is not my family tree, but it does contain some of my family in it the Halper and the Conrath family. 
Now, there's something very interesting if you're going back um, to my third great grandparents, Elias and Maria. As you can see, um, when you have third time great grandparents, you have altogether 32 um, great three time great grandparents. I believe that's correct. Um, you have 32 great great grand, great 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 grandparents. As you can see on this chart, Elias and Maria are listed on two of the lines. Um, as you can see, Elias and Maria had Stephen Halper. And they also had Maria Halper. But Maria and Stephen both married Conrath, um, which tells me that there is a lot of marriage in between the families of Halper and Conrath, meaning they were most likely a first, first cousin marriages, and there were probably several of them. So as you can see, um, Franz um, Conrath is related to Maria Conrath, and Elias Halper is related to um, Rosalia Halper, so as you can see, there's a lot of uh, what's called, in this case, endogamy, where people lived in a certain region for so long, for so, for so many years, and there were only so many families that they can marry into. <clears throat> they eventually married into um, cousin family. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of Halper and Conrath in that side of the family on this section and showing that th two sets of the third great grandparents in this family are the same people, which is very interesting. So keep that in mind in your DNA matches. If some of the numbers are not adding up for you, uh, that they might seem a little too high for a relationship, it might be related to endogamy where cousins married cousins. So DNA is a useful tool to explore your family's history and to understand where they came from, and how to understand how your DNA matches are related to you and to other matches. Using DNA to help build your family trees is a great way of putting it all together. So when I started my journey looking for family, I didn't only look to see who they were, I wanted to meet them. So on one side is the first gentleman I met on Ancestry, Norman Fuhrer. He is my half first cousin once removed. His father is a half brother to my grandfather. And on the other side is my sister Linda. That was our first meeting on a trip I took to, Ale to uh, Alexandria, Virginia. And she met up with me flying in from Tennessee. And we spent four days enjoying museums, monuments, and memorials of our nation's capital and the pool at the hotel and some nice restaurants. But we had a really great time. So I got to meet her another time when she came up for one of my in-person presentations at my local library. So this is my business information. Some of you might know have it already. I know my wife has it already. Um, but take a screenshot or a picture of it with your phone uh, so you have it. I do share the slides, even though we're recording it. Um, I will share the slides with the library as well, just in case they want to send it out to people who either can't get online um, or um, don't want to watch the video and just want the slides for the information, um, I'll share it along with them. So take the information down, my phone number, give me a call if you wish. And those are my slides. And I will stop sharing. And I'm going to close this. Oh, I didn't lose anybody. <laughs> That's good. And my wife is back indoors again. <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you, Eric. Learned so much. Thank you. Okay. I hope uh, somebody, every, everybody learned a little something. Um, as I said, I, I, I did have this program set up before, but when I went through it tonight uh, during the day, I did move things around a little bit and added a few things. So I wasn't um, up to snuff on exactly what I was going to say. I mean, I know what to say but how to word it and how to put it into place so you understand is not always the easiest. But as I do it more, I learn how to, you know, come across correctly on some of the slides. So 
if anybody has any questions or they want to open anything up, you guys can, um, nobody put anything. Julia, Julia, I see her hand up. Go ahead. You can, we'll let you go first. Okay. Thank you. Um, I had a question about uh, my heritage because I'm already on there. I'm a paid member. I just ordered the DNA test. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using their DNA? My heritage is very, very good. The one thing you'll find about my heritage is they have a lot of good genealogy tools, trees, and research. So they actually have things uh, a little better than Ancestry and 23 and me do have combined. The one thing you will find is you might not find as many matches as you would on 23 and me uh, on, on Ancestry because Ancestry has the bigger database. Yeah. But if you are less from the United States and more, if your family's more from out of the country recently, my heritage is a good choice because they do carry a lot more out of the country uh, a lot more out of the country matches, out of the United States matches. So it's a good choice, especially if your family's uh, recently here over the last, uh, your generation, the, the one before you or the one before you. Um, they are based in Israel and they have a lot more European and more worldwide uh, usage than Ancestry and 23 and may do. Right. So that's a good uh, advantage. And uh, definitely go online to look at whatever tools they have. They do have a chromosome browser um, so that you can look at different segments of your DNA matches to see if they match up with other DNA segments of other matches. Mm -hmm. uh, you can overlay them. You can do up to seven people and lay them out next to each other and see exactly which sections of segments on the chromosomes uh, you share with specific people. Um, now, if you get seven of them all together and they're all showing a, a large portion of DNA segment, let's say on chromosome three, you could put them in one box and say, uh, this comes from one direct line or close to one direct line with those segments. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, that, uh, Natalie, is that your correct name now? Uh, Francine. Francine, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> question about yeah. cross cousins and parallel cousins right Does right one of them share more dna than the other um well you have you have where um you can have what's called dozen cut co double cousins and you can have actually three quarter cousins so the uh the more people that created those cousins from the same family is going to show a higher dna a higher amount of centimorgans um, for instance, I'm going to share more DNA with that, those Halper cousins and those Conrath cousins because the cousins married cousins and had children together. So those that's uh, endogamy and uh, it can get a little it can get a little crazy. I, I could probably do a whole uh, presentation just on that and how it relates to um, how much more centimorgans you're going to get. Um, if they're very close to you and they're cousins, then you're going to see, let's say, 75% uh, more um, or like 25% like more. So if you have, if you share 50 centimorgans with somebody normally in that range, <coughs> excuse me, you might have 75. Based on those cousins marrying cousins and having children. So as you saw in that one slide, who of these third great grandparents are the same people? Um, and one of the tools on MyHeritage and a couple of them show um, what's called, you can actually map the segments of your family and we'll put them into blocks. Now, if you have a lot of nice, even square blocks, all of different colors, that there's less endogamy. But if you have one big blob of a blocks at the top, and a lot of smaller ones at the bottom, that would mean that there's a lot more endogamy because it means you have a lot less um, actual great-great-grandparents or great-great-great-great-grandparents, depending how far back they go. Uh, the more people, cousins married into each other, uh, the less of those nice, even colored boxes you're gonna have in your, in your mapping. Um, and if you have a lot of endogamy, you're gonna have 
uh, a big box of a whole bunch of people who all might be related to each other on those same segments of DNA because they're all sort of related to each other. So and, and in some ways, in a small amount of centimorgans, I share DNA with my daughter's uh, maternal great grandmother, my wife, and one of our friends who turns into a cousin. And most of it is all related because of the Ashkenazi Jewish and people who lived in an area called the Pale Settlement for a very, very long time, up to 700 years. And they really couldn't go anywhere and there were only so many families. So that's what happened. And then there are others that did it for religious reasons or purity reasons. You know, we want to keep it within the family kind of thing. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, yes. I get a little carried away sometimes, genealogy. So Barbara, do you have any questions? My wife has heard it all, so I, I don't think she's going to have any questions. Um, Barbara or Mara, Mar, I don't know how to pronounce the name, or anybody else has any other questions you can always answer. Oh. My wife brings me coffee after every, during every presentation. So I it, guess it's... Um, mm -hmm depending on where you're, where you're searching or you know what area of the world you're searching would really depend on which DNA test you would um, look at? Um, yeah, I mean, there are several reasons for doing several. Um, most of the people I speak to or clients that I speak to, I generally recommend Ancestry uh, for a couple of reasons. One, they might not have the best genetic genealogy tools, but they do have the best research. Uh, they do have the most records. So learning more about your family is easier right through one site. You have your tree, you have your research, and you have some genetic tools. You can also move your DNA data, like I said, to other places like MyHeritage. So it'll even give you more matches. From MyHeritage, um, Julia, you can't move your DNA to 23andMe and Ancestry but you can move my heritage to family tree DNA, which will give you some more matches, living DNA and GEDmatch. Now just be careful with GEDmatch a little bit. When you go into GEDmatch and you want to post your DNA there, uh, you would download it from my heritage and upload it to GEDmatch. But there are a lot of check boxes for privacy. So decide what level of privacy you want to achieve. Um, they give you the option of using an alias, obviously. Um, it will show your yeah, uh, an email address. So you can make up um, make up a one that you're not going to use for anything else. That way, you know, the only thing you're using it for is GEDmatch. So that's another way of keeping it private. Uh, use an alias. And if you're against them using your DNA for like law enforcement, there's a box to uncheck also. So that, for instance, you have a, a third cousin that committed some heinous crime and they have his DNA and they've been looking for him and you post your DNA on there and you come up as a match, they're gonna, they're gonna build your family tree to find out how you're related to him. And then they're gonna find out who he is based on that DNA match. Like some gentleman recently got arrested for rape apparently because apparently he did not uncheck that box on Jed Match. And maybe he didn't think he did something wrong. Maybe he thought he was innocent and it was a consensual or whatever, you know, whatever his explanation was, but he was still charged with the crime and they couldn't find him, but they had his DNA. He put his DNA on Jed Match and they found him directly because once they find a match, they're like, oh, look, here's him himself. It wasn't even where they had to build a huge tree for him. He was right there. I mean, the, the, the Golden State Killer, they looked for 40 years. They had his DNA. Until somebody came up with a decent match on GEDmatch, they traced that person's tree and they found out who he was based on that. So it's really weird. I mean, they're using it for a lot of things. They don't really use it a lot for health insurance things there's very slim chance that they're going to be able to find your identity and steal your money or get into your bank account because it's not tied to your DNA. 
don't let them start chipping you. <laughs> you know, I don't mean DNA chipping you and saying, okay, we're going to tie this to your bank account now. Um, but always be careful. Read the fine print, read the policies of privacy that any company has. Don't spend money on subscriptions that are not necessary. Um, my Heritage is a good company. Uh, I don't use them a lot only because um, I pay for other things already that I use regularly, Ancestry, 23andMe, um, newspapers.com for research. So I don't, I mean, I use them for certain things, depending if some of my clients might have it. Um, one of my clients put her DNA everywhere. She tested everywhere. So I'll use it to, I'll scoot around and look for new DNA matches that she might have to help her build a tree more. Any other questions, comments, concerns, jokes, antidotes? <laughs> All right. How's the coffee? Oh, awesome, honey. <laughs> always, always awesome. Okay, that is all. That is all. We get the we get we get really good coffee. I get some from a friend who's a distributor, and we get also eight o'clock coffee. Which is good. So um, I'm glad my dog didn't interrupt too much. Um, if you didn't see my other programs. Um, if you want to just send an email to me, I can send you a copy of the other programs I did um, in, a, in a form of um, PDF file slides. Um, I did record this, but I'm going to stop.